اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكسل والهرم والمأثم والمغرم ومن فتنة القبر وعذاب القبر ومن فتنة النار وعذاب النار اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكسل والهرم والمأثم والمغرم ومن فتنة القبر وعذاب القبر ومن فتنة النار وعذاب النار اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكسل والهرم والمأثم والمغرم ومن فتنة القبر وعذاب القبر ومن فتنة النار وعذاب النار اللهم إني أسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم وأعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم اللهم إني أسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم وأعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم اللهم إني أسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم وأعوذ بك منه وآجله ما علمت منه وما لم أعلم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن سهلا إذا شئت اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلت تجعل الحزن سهلا إذا شئت اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن سهلا إذا شئت اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها وأجرنا من خزي الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها وأجرنا من خزي الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you all doing? 
الحمد لله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهد قلبي وسدد لساني واسلل سخيمة قلبي آمين يا رب العالمين So any afterthoughts about Khadija رضي الله عنها uh, after the class? Any, anything you thought of during the day, or maybe it's something you reflected upon? Yes, go ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Regarding the hadith of Jibreel that you mentioned yesterday in the class, mm -hmm. was this towards uh, her nearing to death that uh, Allah gave her the glad tidings of her house in Jannah? Allahu alam. Yeah, because I tried finding the source as to, like, was this something... Any the hadith is definitely... The authentic. hadith is there. Found. However, the timeline exactly, I'm not aware of. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And, uh, when we look at the lives of different companions who were given the good news of paradise, uh, they weren't just given the good news of paradise close to their death, right? Uh, any, some of them were given good news of paradise during the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, and they died many, many years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to add that I was thinking about uh, Khadija Rabi Allah, who was sitting in the Sudan. Can you just take it? Yes. Yeah. Bismillah. So I was uh, just thinking about Khadija Rabi Allah yesterday and uh, uh, the thought that came to my mind was that she was able to balance the love for her husband and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I was just, you know, praying that may Allah give me the wisdom to do that as well. Because sometimes we go to one extreme. I mean, not yeah. that um, going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, towards him is an extreme, but uh, we need to learn the balance, uh, yes. you know. Yes, and your word that you used over here, balance it. You know, you can really appreciate the life of Khadija radiallahu anha, what an amazing wife she was, what an amazing mother she was, what an amazing believer she was, right? Subhanallah, all of that in one. Amazing. Okay, let's begin. Today, inshallah, we will do, uh, we will talk about Sauda radiallahu anha. Sauda binta Zam'at ibn Qais al Qurashiya al Amiriya. And she is the second woman that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married. And we learned that Sauda radiallahu anha, uh, you can see from her name, al Qurashiya. So who is she? She's from the Quraysh. So, so she's also from Makkah. And she's also uh, related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But like I mentioned, Khadija radiallahu anha was closer in terms of lineage uh, as a, as compared to the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, Sauda radiallahu anha was first married to Sakran bin Amr. All right, and he is the brother of Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr is more commonly known; he's more famous. Uh, and Sakran uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, he, him and and Sauda radiallahu anha, both of them embraced Islam. And both of them actually migrated to Habasha. All right, both of them migrated to Habasha in the second migration. And this shows us that they were among those who were persecuted, even though she was from the Quraysh. And according to some reports, she had five children with him. According to other reports, she had one child with him, Allahu A'lam. But she did have children with her first husband. We learned that after some time, uh, both visited Mecca, and this could be for any reason. And we also learned that there was uh, new rumors that had spread that the people of Mecca had embraced Islam. So the people who had, the Muslims who had migrated to Abyssinia returned to Mecca. But when they returned, they found out that uh, it was a rumor. So uh, when she was in Mecca, uh, it is said that she had a dream that the moon fell on her from the sky. And this is a, a, a very strange dream, right? So she mentioned it to her husband and her husband interpreted the dream. And he said that, I do not think that I'm going to remain alive for a very long time. 
And I think that you're going to marry someone after me. And, and this shows us, first of all, about the uh, reality of dreams. Remember that there are three types of dreams, right? There are those dreams which are hadith or nafs. So, for example, you have a cat and you see the cat in your dream. Don't worry about that dream. Okay. It is uh, Eid al-Adha. And you see in your dream that, that a cow is being slaughtered. Don't worry about that dream. Okay. You're going to travel somewhere in your dream. You see that you're already there. Don't worry about that dream. It's just hadith and nafs. Things that are happening in your life, you just, your, your brain is, you know, pr processing all the, uh, you know, things that are going on in your life. So this is hadith and nafs. Another type of dream is uh, that which is from shaitan, right? Those dreams which are either very scary or they are, you know, of sexual nature. So these are from shaitan. And we know what to do uh, on, uh, on having such a dream. You, as you wake up in fear, you seek refuge with Allah and you say the dua. You, you spit to your left three times. And then the third type of dreams are those which are real, those which are true, those which certainly have a meaning. And it's important that, you know, you don't just interpret things yourself and, and don't just, you know, uh, uh, and be careful about giving interpretation. Because we learn that once the interpretation is given, then that is what happens, right? So you have to be careful. And you see, there are levels of interpretation. Uh, the scholar re recently, uh, somebody mentioned to me about how uh, her mother passed away. And, you know, this, this lady was having uh, this dream constantly that her mother is calling her. Okay. So the sister was in fear that I am going to die very soon. And that fear was kind of overtaking her, right? That her mother passed away and she sees in her dream that her mother is calling her. So on the surface, it seems like I am going to go where my mother is, right? So I asked this, this sheikh and he mentioned that this is not the interpretation. The interpretation is that out of all of her children, her mother loved her the most. That's why she's calling her. And he asked me about how the mother died. And I mentioned that, you know, she died because of a certain illness. And he said, this was a very good death. Because who, who is alive? Who, who does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe as alive even after they have passed away? Shuhada, right? So, and, no, and remember that shahada is not, just, is not just in the battlefield, right? There is, in hadith, we learn that, you know, a person who dies because of certain diseases, uh, their death is also a death of shahada. So he said that this is a very good sign. And uh, I thought that that interpretation was so beautiful. It, and when I mentioned that to the sister, you know, she felt so relieved, so relieved. So it's important that when you have a dream like this, then, then uh, talk to someone of knowledge, right? And, and also uh, expect good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when Yusuf alayhi salam gave the interpretation of the dream. He didn't just give the interpretation that this is what the cows mean. This is what the ears of corn mean. No, he gave the interpretation and he also gave a solution, a tadbir, right? A, a plan of action. So uh, don't just interpret dreams as, okay, this is what this means and this is what that means. After the meeting, there must be some kind of action, right? So anyway... Uh, this is uh, reported uh, regarding him. Now, after his death, uh, after the death of Sakran uh, bin Umar, we learned that uh, Khawla bin Hakim, the wife of Uthman bin Mad'un, came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. But now, what had happened? Two two things had happened. On the one hand, the husband of Sauda radiallahu anha had passed away, and on the other hand, Khadija radiallahu anha had also passed away. All right. So this happened around the same time. Some reports mention after a few days. Uh, some reports mention that this happened after a few years. Uh, anyway, Khawla uh, radiallahu anha came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She visited him and she saw that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was clearly, very visibly distressed. And this could be, of course, because his wife had passed away. And even if it had been. Uh, uh, two to three years, as some reports suggest, 
uh, grief is not something that you can get over quickly, right? And grief is something, grief over the loss of someone that you love deeply is real. And that grief was visible on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he also had uh, children uh, and not just his family, but also the opposition of the people of Mecca. And remember that Khadija radiallahu anha was his source of comfort, right? So Khawla radiallahu anha, when she came and she noticed, you know, uh, she saw how distressed he was, she suggested to him that, why don't you get married? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed, all right? So then Khawla radiallahu anha suggested two women, Sauda radiallahu anha, as well as Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha was very young at this point. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, so Khawla radiallahu anha went to Sauda uh, radiallahu anha and, you know, the proposal, etc. and the marriage took place. So uh, we see that now Sauda radiallahu anha was the only wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the next three years. So this is also something that Sauda radiallahu anha uh, exclusively uh, benefited from or enjoyed the com the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Uh, Sauda radiallahu anha, we learned that she was a tall woman. Okay. She was a tall woman uh, who was uh, in a, uh, very noticeable in, in the sense that you couldn't miss her in a crowd, okay? Uh, and there is a hadith in which we learn that Sauda radiallahu anha went out at night uh, for some need. And at that time, especially women, women would go out in the night to use the bathroom. So she went out and Umar radiallahu anhu saw her and he recognized her and he said that by Allah, O Sauda, you cannot hide from us. Mm -hmm. So basically what he wanted was that, you know, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should completely cover themselves and they should not be recognized or visible outside. But Sallallahu radiallahu anha is a tall woman. How is she meant to conceal her height? Right? How, how is she meant to hide herself completely? So she was upset and she went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we learn in a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was actually eating food at the time and there was a bone covered in meat in his hand. So he was eating. And she mentioned to him what Umar radiallahu anhu uh, said. She complained to him. And then revelation was sent regarding uh, hijab. But the Prophet ﷺ also added that you have been allowed by Allah to go out for your needs. Mm -hmm. That yes, there must be a screen between you and the men. All right. Uh, however, this doesn't mean that you are not allowed to step outside the house. So the Prophet ﷺ kind of agreed with Umar anhu, but also kind of did not. Mm -hmm that yes, a woman will take the necessary steps to cover herself, yes, but she cannot erase her identity or her existence or conceal herself completely outside. So Khawla radiallahu anha was a tall woman. And we also learned that she was a very affectionate woman. Okay, And uh, remember that first she migrated to, uh, before I would talk about her uh, affection, uh, she migrated to Abyssinia. She returned to Mecca. She became a widow. She married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then what happened? She migrated to Medina. So she is of those people who migrated two times in the way of Allah. And uh, she was a very affectionate woman. We learned that Aisha radiallahu anha, she reported, this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. She said that never did I find any woman more loving to me than Sauda bint Zamra. Can you imagine? Any Sauda radiallahu anha was, uh, you know, the only wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for three years, and then comes Aisha radiallahu anha, and Aisha radiallahu anha is, you know, young and uh, very intelligent and outspoken, and you know, she's clearly very much loved by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and yet she is saying that I did not find any woman more affectionate and loving towards me than Sauda radiallahu anha. And this could also be because of the age difference. 
uh, we learn, you know, through different reports regarding Saudi radiallahu anha that she was an older woman. And Aisha radiallahu anha was a very young girl. And you know, this shows us that especially when there's an, a huge age difference, then there must be love and compassion on the part of the older person towards the younger person. And these are co-wives. But it's amazing how sometimes, you know, when it comes to bringing your own daughter-in-law, many women fail to show affection towards their daughter-in-law. Is, isn't this amazing? Why, why is there even a competition over here? It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, you love your son. You want the best for your son. You choose someone nice for your son. You bring her home or you bring her into your life. Now, where's the affection? Why the constant criticism? So Sauda radiallahu anha is so affectionate that Aisha radiallahu anha is saying this. And Aisha radiallahu anha says that I wish I could be like her. I wish I could be like her. And she was too, too loving. She was too kind. She was too generous. And I, I, I could not be like her is basically what Aisha radiallahu anha is saying. And then she mentions that as Sauda became old, she gave me her day, which she used to have with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because remember, we learned earlier that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he, he loved to spend time with Aisha radiallahu anha, and everybody knew about that, which is why whenever he would be with her, people would send gifts, right? So... Look at Sauda radiallahu anha that she for her the the you know her love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is greater than her love for herself, right? So she gave uh, her day that she would have with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to Aisha radiallahu anha. And in another hadith, we learned that Aisha radiallahu anha said that whenever Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam intended to go on a journey. He used to draw lots among his wives and would take with him the one on whom the lot fell. She's basically talking about the justice of the Prophet. And she said that he also used to fix for every one of his wives a day and a night. So each of his wives had one day, one night, all to herself with the Prophet. But Sauda radiallahu anha gave her day and night to Aisha radiallahu anha. Why? Intending to please the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where there's even a slight competition, even if we don't need something, even if we don't desire something, we don't like something, we want to make sure we take it. Right? To prove to the other person that, hey, I exist. Right? I matter. And you can't compete with me. And he look at the level of generosity. And this is why Aisha radiallahu anha said that I wish I could be like her, but I know that I'm not. Subhanallah. Sauda radiallahu anha, uh, we learned through you know, other narrations that uh, she gave up her day uh, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because she feared that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would divorce her, or it, it, this is mentioned in one narration, or that she became very old. In another narration, we learned that she mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam herself that I I am not in need of a man. Yani I'm past that age. I I don't seek that companionship. All I want is that I am your wife in the hereafter. Also, so she just wanted to remain married to him. And people are different, right? Some women are some people are such that they they must have close companionship with a spouse, right? And there are other people who who don't who are not in need of that. Right, who 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 do, who do not desire that. So anyway, uh, Sauda radiallahu anha, her goal was the akhirah. Uh, we also learned that Sauda radiallahu anha was an abida, and she she used to worship uh, Allah azza wa jal. Uh, and we, you know, through these narrations, we learned that she was, uh, you know, older in her age. Yet, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went for Hajj. Sauda radiallahu anha also went for Hajj, right? And in a hadith, we learn that she was a slow-moving woman, meaning it was difficult for her to move fast, 
right? And this happens with age, right? In some in, in some other hadiths, we learned that she was also a, a large woman. So sometimes due to health, due to weight, due to age, it, it becomes difficult to move, right? To, to walk. So Sauda radiallahu anha still went for hajj. And she asked the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for permission to depart from Muzdalifa ahead of the people. Right? And whenever we talk about the fiqh of hajj, especially uh, this, this part, Muzdalifa, this hadith of Sauda radiallahu anha is always discussed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her permission. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned years later that how she, uh, you know, she, she wished that she had also, uh, you know, left earlier. Sauda radiallahu anha, uh, from uh, other hadith, we learned that she was also a very simple woman. And she wasn't, you know, some, some people are very like street smart, um, you know, not clever. I don't want to say clever, but, you know, they, they know how to, yeah, and, and, and they know how to pick fights and they know how to, you know, you get the sense. She she was a very simple woman, a very, uh, I don't want to say naive, but simple in the sense that she just did whatever. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Go with the flow, right? Go with the flow. And uh, she was easy to convince. Uh, in a hadith, we learned that, uh, you know, the hadith about the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some of them planning to, um, you know, tell him that, oh, did you have maghafir, all right? When he had actually had honey. So the point was to make the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam avoid a certain wife, right? Or uh, you know, avoid having that drink with her, the, the honey with her. So. Aisha radiallahu anha, this hadith, we learned that she went to Sauda radiallahu anha and she told her that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to you, you have to say to him, did you have such and such drink? And he's going to say, no, I had honey. Then you're going to say that your breath smells. Right? And then he's going to say this. And then you're going to say this. So Sauda radiallahu anha agreed because... This is Aisha radiallahu anha telling her, right? And we learn in hadith that Sauda radiallahu anha said that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, I was going to, you know, say what you told me to say. And I hesitated, but then I said it anyway out of fear of you. And she was afraid of Aisha radiallahu anha, right? And then she said it. She said what Aisha radiallahu anha had told her to say. And then when she saw that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided not to have any honey, and he said, لا حاجة لي فيه, she said, Sauda radiallahu anha said, Wallahi laqad haramnahum. By Allah, we have deprived him. This isn't right. And this plotting and, you know, uh, trying to uh, prevent him from having honey, this wasn't a good thing to do. We have prevented him. But... Aisha radiallahu anha told her, Uskuti, be quiet, don't say a word. Right? So Sauda radiallahu anha, she wasn't an argumentative person. Right? And uh, you know, sometimes it happens that you, you don't realize what you're getting into because you're too simple, and that's okay. Right? That's okay. You know, sometimes you realize after the fact that people have maybe taken advantage of you or maybe they have told you to do something that suits them, but it's to your disadvantage or to someone else's disadvantage. And then you have regrets and you wonder, why am I so foolish? Right? It's not that you're foolish. It's just that you, you didn't suspect anything evil. Right? It, it shows that you have husnulan. Right? So Sauda radiallahu anha was like that. Sauda radiallahu anha uh, uh, lived for about 34 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. And it is said that she died during the time of Muawiyah. She lived a very long life. And it is also said that she remained in Medina after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning uh, she did not leave the city of Medina at all. For all those years, 34 years. And we learned that 
the the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, they would go for Hajj. Umar radiallahu anhu would send them for Hajj as a group, but Sauda radiallahu anha would not go with them because her understanding was that uh, based on what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said to his wives, that they were supposed to remain at home, right after after their first Hajj. Now they were supposed to remain at home and not go anywhere. So she remained there. And this also shows us her simplicity, right? And her contentment, subhanAllah. Yeah, exactly. And in the Quran also it says, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ So she took that very literally and she didn't make a big deal about it. And we learned that after uh, the death of Umar radiallahu anhu especially, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, political issues, you can say. Right? But Sauda radiallahu anha kept herself away from all of these matters. She didn't um, you know, interfere or comment or take part in any such activities. And this is also from wisdom. Right? SubhanAllah, you know, we are sitting in one country and obsessing over the politics of another country. Uh, what happened where and what happened where. So you know, be careful about the use of your tongue. Be careful about the use of your time. Uh, you know, certain videos, forwarded messages seem very uh, real. And, uh, you know, you, you want to believe them. You want to spend your time watching them, reading up on them. You know, if you are concerned about the state of a nation, anything, make dua, right? Your watching, your commentary is not going to bring any solution. So Sauda radiallahu anha was someone who kept away from all of these matters, minded her own business. And uh, we also learned that she reported many ahadiths uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything you would like to say before we continue? Anything you'd like to add? Any reflection, comment, question? Or shall we continue? Continue? Okay. Yes, go ahead. I, 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 I remember learning uh, she also had um, a very simple and beautiful sense of humor yeah. uh, that once she joined Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Qiyam mm -hmm. and the ruku was so long that she held her nose mm -hmm. and later on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked her, why did you hold your nose? She said, I was afraid that the blood would come out. Yeah. So yeah. it was purely out of joke and she had a very light sense of humor. Yeah, uh, this is reported in Ibn Sa'd. Yeah, and um, there are other narrations also that show us about her sense of humor. Yeah, okay. Barakallahu fikum. All right, next inshallah, we will talk about Aisha radiallahu anha. I thought of uh, skipping Aisha radiallahu anha, because I was like, there's no way I can do justice uh, to talking about her life. Uh, but then I thought not talking about her is also great injustice. So something is better than nothing. Yeah. So inshallah, we'll spend the next 30 minutes talking about Aisha radiallahu anha, inshallah. Aisha radiallahu anha, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. She is also from the Quraysh, and she is the third wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam married her in the second year of the Hijrah, after the Battle of Badr. And Aisha radiallahu anha. There's so much to learn about her, uh, and so much to learn from her, that. You know, if, if we were to talk about, let's say, her marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's so much that we can learn, right? her relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we want to talk about her knowledge, her expertise, you know, the way she taught, that is a completely different topic as well. Uh, so we're going to try to cover everything a little bit, inshallah. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha was born after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received prophethood. So this means that she opened her eyes during the period of Islam. She never witnessed jahiliyyah. She never witnessed ignorance, right? 
And she saw her parents following Islam. Right? So Islam is what she knew from the, from the beginning. And this is one of the reasons why she's also one of the most knowledgeable women when it comes to the deen. Because she was the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then when she got married, she got married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she got married very early. Right? So she was always exposed to ilm. And you see, our deen is not just about you know, studying this ruling and that ruling and this matter and that matter. Uh, deen is, is amal. It's not just ilm, it's also amal. It's action. And how do you learn uh, about religious action? Through observation, through participation, right? By, by witnessing, by experiencing. And Aisha radiallahu anha always had that. We learned that uh, she is described as the most knowledgeable uh, woman of this ummah. In fact, some ulama say that if all of the knowledge of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ was on one side and the knowledge of Aisha radiallahu anha on the other, Aisha radiallahu anha's knowledge would be far greater. In fact, she had uh, more knowledge compared to many companions even. Because Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu anhu said that whenever us companions had an issue and we went to Aisha radiallahu anha and we asked her, we always learned something from her about that matter. So no matter what, mad, no matter what issue it was, they always learned something about that issue from Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha is a woman whose, uh, whose innocence uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in the Quran, right? When some people falsely accused her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses defending her and declaring her innocence. And that, that shows us what a high position she has near her Lord also. And then it's well known that she was the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked, man ahabbu nasi ilayk? When he was asked that, who is the most beloved of all people to you? He said, Aisha. And this is why we learned that Masruq, uh, a tabiri, whenever he you know, would relate something about Aisha, uh, that something that he had learned from her, he would say, حدثتني المبرأة الصديقة ابنة الصديق Habibatu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That who narrated to me? Al Mubarra'a. Mubarra'a, meaning the one whose innocence has been revealed by Allah. Right? Whose, whose innocence is established. She's free of guilt. Secondly, a Siddiqa. The one who is truthful, just like her father, a Siddiq. Right? Ibn to Siddiq. The daughter of the truthful one. And then Habiba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The beloved of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how he would mention her. He would not say haddathatni Aisha. That Aisha narrated to me. No, he would describe her in this way. In fact, he didn't even mention her name. Hmm? Because this was enough to show who he was talking about. Aisha radiallahu anha is the only uh, young woman uh, or unmarried woman that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam ever married. Meaning she was never married before. Right? If you think about it, Khadija radiallahu anha was married twice before widowed. Right? Sauda radiallahu anha, she was also uh, married before uh, widowed. And then the other wives also married or divorced, except for Aisha radiallahu anha. And we learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed in his dream about his marriage to her. In a hadith, we learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her that I saw you in a dream. An angel brought you to me wrapped in a piece of silken cloth and said to me that this is your wife. This is your wife. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if this is from Allah, then it will surely be. 
And it did, in fact, happen, right, after the migration. And we learned that she is the wife of the Prophet wasallam in this life and also in the hereafter. She was beloved to the Prophet wasallam and even uh, Jibreel alayhi uh, salam, you know, had great respect for her. We learn that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that فَإِنَّ الْوَحْيَ لَمْ يَأْتِنِي وَأَنَا فِي ثَوْبِ امْرَأَةٍ إِلَّا عائشة. This is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That wahi does not come to me on any of my beds except that of Aisha radiallahu anha. And when I'm with her, then yes, revelation comes to me. But when I'm in, in any other of my houses, the revelation does not come. Jibreel did not come over there. So this shows us her virtue. And we also learn that, uh, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he loved to be with her, the people knew that. And like I mentioned earlier, they would, they would send gifts to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially when he was with her, radiallahu anha. She also has the privilege of being with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. Right? He fell ill. Uh, and then he came to her house, and then he did not leave from there. And he passed away in her house. In fact, he passed away while he was reclining on her. And he passed away while uh, after he had used the siwak that she had chewed and softened in her mouth. And when it comes to, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha and Khadija radiallahu anha, people wonder, well, who's better? There's no need for such uh, comparison. Okay. Why? Because both are excellent in their own way. Because in the beginning of prophethood, Khadija radiallahu anha, and he, she served a role which no one else did. Right. So she has a privilege that no one else has. And later on, Aisha radiallahu anha, she served a role that no one else did. So both are special and there's no need for uh, such comparison. Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, of course, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved her. So he would call her Aisha. He would also call her Aish. He would call her Humayra. He would call her Ibn al Siddiq. He would call her Al Muwaffaqa. Muwaffaqa means the one who has been given tawfiq. Tawfiq to do something good. Someone who has been given the ability to do something good. And her kunya is Umm Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah. Did she have a son? No, she did not. So who's the Abdullah? Her nephew, right? whom, whom she loved dearly. And... Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, you know, she was a very intelligent woman who did not just, you know, enjoy the companionship and love of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She also benefited from his companionship, and so we learned that she would ask him many questions, right? And uh, she would, uh, you know, ask him about different verses of the Quran. Uh, you know, their meaning, if there was any question that she had, she would ask that if she noticed something in the Prophet Sallallahu behavior, like the incident we learned, uh, a man came and the Prophet Sallallahu warned her that he's the worst of his people. But then the Prophet Sallallahu met him very nicely, right? So she asked him that, how come you said that he's the worst of the people, but then you spoke to him so nicely, right? So the Prophet ﷺ explained that the worst of the people is the one whom others leave because of his bad akhlaq. So yes, he may be a bad person, but that doesn't mean that I have to be bad towards him. That means you have to be careful around him, right? So she would uh, you know, enjoy the company of the Prophet ﷺ, but she also learned from him. And this is something very important. You know, sometimes we want to be around people of knowledge, but then all we want to talk about is you know, what do you do? Or, uh, you know, their food or drink and things like that. Then that's nice. But then also benefit from their company, right? Learn the deen from them or, you know, make use of that opportunity. Uh, we also learned that um, the Sahaba, 
knew how much the Prophet وسلم, loved her. Uh, Umar radiallahu anhu warned his daughter Hafsa radiallahu anha right, that uh, don't be deceived by Aisha radiallahu anha. And you don't think that you can behave like her or act like her, do the things that she does, because you're not like her. She is beloved to the Prophet. She has a very you know, special place near him. So even Umar anhu knew. The companions of the Prophet knew. And this is because the Prophet expressed his love for her. He he didn't hide that. He you know, when he was asked, who do you love the most? He mentioned Aisha radiallahu anhu. And when he was with her, uh, he gave her importance. We learn about how, you know, when he would eat with her, he would drink from the same cup, right? And the same place where she drank from. He would eat from the same place of the bone that she ate from. And he also used loving words towards her. And, uh, you know, if she had any wishes, any requests, he fulfilled those. You know, for example, when they went for Hajj and she wasn't able to, you know, do Umrah because she started her period. Uh, afterwards, what happened? Everyone waited while she went to a Tanarim with her brother, came back to Mecca, did her Umrah, and then they left. So everyone knew that the Prophet وسلم, loved her. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, also spent time with her. Uh, you know, we learn about how he raced with her, right, at one occasion. And then when there was a show going on in the masjid, the Prophet وسلم, you know, uh, offered her to watch the show, and she did. Uh, so, and the Prophet وسلم, also took interest in her things, uh, in, in what she, uh, you know, had to say. Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, would also put his head in her lap and recite the Quran. Subhanallah. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, also uh, cared about her comfort and rest. Uh, we learn in a hadith about how once the Prophet وسلم, woke up in the night and he turned his side, and he, he, he got up, he turned his side, he put on his uh, cloak. And then he, uh, you know, put his uh, shoes on, everything very quietly. And everything Aisha radiallahu anha mentions, he did that very slowly, very quietly. And then he left very quietly. And then Aisha radiallahu anha also got up very quietly and she went after him to see what where he was going. Uh, but the main thing here is that he did not want to disturb her. You see, sometimes we think that love means frankness and frankness means disrespect and disrespect or frankness means that you don't care about the comfort or the ease of the other person and and that is not the case uh, love uh, and affection lead to greater respect and care you know sometimes people say uh, when when people get married you know at the beginning yes you care for each other but then see what happens after a few years after a few years, after more years, there should be more care and concern, right? Uh, not that I'm not going to do anything for you and you're, gonna, you're not going to do anything for me. Uh, th that, that's not real love. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also loved to spend time with her. And this is something that is very uh, important for us to reflect on, you know, the Prophet ﷺ would spend one day and night with each of his wives, but with her, he would spend two days, two nights. Have you ever heard of or witnessed some men avoiding their wives? Or deliberately spending time away from home? Or going in their man caves? Yeah? Have you witnessed it? Heard of it? That's not healthy. That a man is trying to get away from his wife. This is not healthy at all. This is a huge problem. It, it's, it's a, it shows that the relationship is not working. There is a huge problem in the relationship. 
when when does someone avoid another when they don't feel safe with them right like for example if you know that there is a person who every time when you see them they're going to criticize you they're going to talk about your appearance or something about you are you going to make eye contact with them you're going to try to avoid them as best as you can right why because you don't feel safe with them you don't feel comfortable with them you feel threatened around them right and subhanallah sometimes it happens in a marriage that a man does not feel safe safe in the sense that he doesn't feel at ease because he knows that there will be constant complaining constant ingratitude a, a list of never ending things to be done right and then uh, there was a time when you know people would talk with some kind of respect treating another person the other person with some level of dignity and now that is all out the window so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam love to spend time with aisha radhiyallahu anha love is not in the form of flowers and uh plastic balloons okay it's not in the form of sugar filled cakes and desserts and things that you know advertise your name that's not real love you can have all of these things filling your house but if you're not willing to make eye contact with one another you don't feel comfortable sitting with one another eating with one another eating together then that's a huge problem the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and aisha radhiyallahu anha we see that they're eating together drinking from the same cup eating from the same piece of meat right so there you know make make your home a safe space for your spouse for your children right sometimes even children don't feel safe in the house that they know god forbid if they touch something in the kitchen or they you know you know eat something they're going to be in trouble so the house should be a safe space uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would make her laugh and she would also make him laugh uh you know there is uh, an interesting story in which we learn aisha radhiyallahu anha said to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you know if there was she mentioned some food all right that if there's this food and you know people have eaten from it lots of it and lots of people have eaten from it but there's one item that people have not eaten from which one would you like and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the one that people have not eaten from so she was basically talking about herself right that everyone uh, that all of your wives are previously married except for me so look at that openness that frankness you know subhanallah confidence exactly confidence and why should a woman not feel confident in the marriage right she should be um uh we also learned that uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh you know didn't make a big deal about her shortcomings and she was human there were times when she felt jealous right so we learned about how one of the other wives of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent food while the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with her and she got very jealous and she threw the dish the dish broke the food fell to the floor and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said gharat ummuki right that your mother became upset your mother became upset uh notice he didn't say anything to her directly because when someone's upset you don't yell at them if you yell at them what's going to happen the situation will escalate right but you do want to console the person who is shocked that what just happened right so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam consoled that person that your mother just became upset and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam validated her feelings of of jealousy and and feeling upset right uh, uh and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh also uh, you know taught her dua or, or rather made dua for her we learned that at one occasion aisha radhiyallahu anha asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that please make dua for me and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made dua that oh allah forgive aisha for all of her sins right beautiful dua 
And Aisha radiallahu anha was so happy that she began to laugh and then she put her head in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, do you, do you like this dua? And she said, of course I do. And he said that I make this dua for my ummah in every salah. I make this dua for my ummah in every salah. Allahumma ghfir li Aishata ma taqaddama min dhambiha wa ma ta'akhar ma asarrat wa ma a'lanat. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also encouraged her to do, uh, you know, different good things. Uh, so for example, he would encourage her to spend generously in the way of Allah. Uh, he also taught her, you know, excellent manners. Uh, once she said that I was on a camel that was somewhat rebellious and I began to beat it. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you must be compassionate. When there is compassion in something, it adorns it. And whenever it is removed from something, it disgraces it. It makes it ugly. Subhanallah. Can you, uh, can you imagine if you're trying to work with something, like let's say the dishwasher even, and you can't get the dishes right, and you start to you know, be a bit harsh. It, these things happen, right? You show your frustration. You, you use harshness in your words, in your movement, in the way that you pick things up, in the way that you put things down. Maybe a pet that you have is misbehaving and, you know, you show harshness. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught her that you must be soft. And he, he told her about rifq. Uh, and whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam noticed something in her behavior that was not appropriate, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did point that out. He he uh, he he taught her in in a very gentle way, in in a very good way. Uh, for example, when some people came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you know uh, they said assalamu alaikum, right? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wa alaikum. Aisha radhiyallahu anha got very upset. She said wa alaikum assalam wa larna wa this wa that. Right, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then told her that you should have said what I said. I just said wa alaikum. Same be to you. Why? Why should I be obscene in my language? Why should I use foul language? So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nurtured her. Right, uh, developed good uh, behavior or, or, or good uh, akhlaq in her. And uh, the and Aisha radhiyallahu anha also we learned that she loved the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam and respected him a great deal as well. Uh, she would also express her love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she, uh, whenever she was upset with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all she did was she left her, she left saying his name. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a hadith, we learned the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to her, "I know that I, I know when you are upset with me and when you are pleased with me." And this shows that sometimes she would be upset. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And this is normal, right? In in a healthy relationship, there must be times when people are happy with one another, and there must be times when they are upset with one another. If someone is always always happy, either they're not being honest. Okay, they're, you know, they're faking or there's something not right that, uh, you know, they, they don't have the room to think independently or, or to think for themselves. They're being controlled. So uh, in a healthy relationship, it must be the case that you are allowed to express your joy and you're also allowed to express your, uh, you know, express when you are upset. So anyway, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha asked that, how do you know that? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that when you are pleased with me, you say no by the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And when you're upset with me, you say no by the Lord of Ibrahim. So Aisha radiallahu anha said, yes, you are right. But by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I don't leave anything but your name. And he, it says that I just don't take your name. That's it. It's not that I will leave you or I will... 
you know, be rude or I will be harsh or I will, you know, do something wrong. No, that's, that's all I do. What a great level of self-control, right? That when we are upset with someone, and remember, we, we are allowed to feel upset when you are hurt, when you're annoyed, when you feel like someone did not treat you fairly, uh, you are allowed to feel upset. And feeling upset does not mean that you express your anger uncontrollably or however that you wish, right? There must be some level of self-control. But self-control does not mean that you suppress yourself so much that you don't have any feelings left or you don't allow yourself to validate any of your feelings. That's not healthy either. Um, then we also learn about how uh, uh, she followed the Prophet hmm? uh, in hadith we learned that she would carry Zamzam with her hand and uh, she said that Allah's messenger وسلم, used to carry Zamzam water in utensils and leather bags and he would sprinkle it on people who were sick and make them drink it also so uh, you know she brought Zamzam and then she told people about this that I am also going to do this. I'm also going to sprinkle it on you because this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Uh, she also showed her love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in different ways. We learned that she would at times wash the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She would comb the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She would apply perfume on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She applied oil on the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She washed the clothes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She made garlands for the sacrificial animals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she also did ruqya on him. She also did ruqya on him. Okay. So exactly. So going back to how she would uh, uh, wash the hair, the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, you, you see these acts of service are what they don't mean I am your slave and you are the boss okay they mean I love you and I care about you one is that you wash your head yourself and yes you are capable of doing that you could do a very good job but why do you go to the hairdressers and get your hair washed what's the reason does it feel nice huh to feel pampered right and yes, they might do a better job. Okay, it's possible. But you also feel pampered. And the, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha would wash the head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make him feel pampered also. Right? And then she would comb the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, was he not able to comb himself? Of course he was. But why, why would you want to comb someone else's hair? pardon out of love right yes um but also he allowed her she must do a very nice job because some people are very harsh in combing other people's hair it hurts they don't care about how they're brushing the hair is getting pulled or you know the brush is hitting the head uh Aisha did a very good job right she put perfume on the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Again, he could do that himself, but she wanted to do it. This is an act of love, an act of service, right? Uh, applied oil on the head of the Prophet ﷺ. And then she also washed the clothes of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, the, the sacrificial animals of the Prophet ﷺ, she would make the garlands. And then when the Prophet ﷺ was ill, she would recite, uh, you know, the Mu'awwidat, and also the dua, imsah al ba'sa rabb al nas biyadika shifa la kashifa lahu illa ant. And then she would blow, uh, you know, uh, on the hand of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and pass his hands on his body or her hands on his body. So this is love. Hmm? Uh, anything you would like to add over here? You would like to say yes. Yeah, I just got stuck with the um, 
incident that uh, she broke mm -hmm. that you can say that professor mm -hmm. said your mother is upset mm -hmm. what a nice words he could have said she's jealous <laughs> you know yeah that would Bharat, be, yeah yeah, yeah. And uh, Bharat is from Rira, and Rira does have a sense of jealousy. Exactly. Right? But not the kind pure. words. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, we'll conclude over here. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.